Awesome. Thank you, Chris. So good morning, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming, getting up so early. Uh, my name is Will Glazier, and I'm here um, on behalf of my colleague and co-author, Mayank Diman. He was unable to make it this week. Uh, both Mayank and I work for a company called Stealth Security. We're based out of California. And what Stealth does is protect against uh, account takeover attacks, fake account creation, all sorts of other fraud committed by bots. And so what we're going to talk about today is uh, some data from our work at Stealth. Uh, we're sharing it courtesy of them. And the, the talk will be sort of in two parts. We're going to talk first about the attacker's perspective of what do attackers require to launch these campaigns, what are the tools they use, um, what are the kind of cr sets of credentials they use, basically just walk you through a list of five pillars from an offensive perspective. Then we'll do the same from a defensive perspective and try to give you guys who, those of you who might be in charge of like defending networks yourselves or gaining visibility into this problem, some low-hanging fruits for you to look at and just see like, okay, now, you know, if I'll look for this pattern and see if I can understand a little bit more about what's going on. So first we'll dive right into it and sort of define what do, what do I mean when I say an automated attack at scale? Well, it's fundamentally a bot problem and it's the portion of traffic that's not a, legitimate users, normal search engines and the like, or aggregators and scrapers like Mint, Yodly, uh, Award Wallet, those kind of things. Those are a, a business problem that we'll ignore for the purposes of this talk. Uh, these attacks are usually executed by attack toolkits available on the underground, custom scripts. They'll attack your API endpoints, not just your website. And determining the intent of these requests is something that we're really interested in to solve this problem. What are, what is the intent of these attackers? Well, account takeover, one I already mentioned. Um, you know, most of you here already probably know about the, the end goal of those campaigns. Fake account creation, the hot topic there is about bots on social media to amplify certain messages, but there's also cases like money laundering. You can create a bunch of fake accounts to route small amounts of payments through. We see PII and PHI theft because that data is typically more valuable for resale on the black market. And then we see shopping bots and ticket bots, another, um, another example of fraud where a criminal will attempt to buy up all existing inventory of a product, be it a ticket, be it a line of clothing, as soon as it comes out, and then resell it for a nice little profit on the, on the, uh, on the underground market. And this isn't necessarily a goal here, API abuse, but it's a common thread between all the above. They'll abuse your APIs to to, you know, to carry out all these, all these attacks and to accomplish their goals. So first part of the talk here, we'll talk about the attacker's perspective, and I'll give you sort of the, the five, what we call the five pillars of a credential exploitation attack. What do I need as an attacker to do this? So first I need black market attack tools or, you know, a custom tool configured for a certain target. I need to scout my target a little bit and have a configuration. I need sets of stolen credentials as well. And I need the ability to rotate over many IP addresses and compute power. These two kind of go hand in hand. And finally, the ability to bypass any deployed solution. And by that, I mean uh, I need to be able to find a rate limit that's, you know, that sort of is operating on this site, or I need to be able to uh, rotate past, you know, whatever defenses the, these guys have in place. So first, we'll, we'll dive into the first one, and I'll give some, some examples of a common attack toolkits and, and config files. This is just a short list of, you know, the top one there, Sentry MBA is the most popular attack tool for these kind of attacks that we see. Uh, another name that's typically used for these on the underground is called cracking. Maybe some of you are more familiar with that than calling these credential exploitation or credential stuffing. But here are other tools. Hydra, Medusa are some older ones. There's headless browsers like PhantomJS. There's command line tools like curl and wget, and then custom scripts that you know keep popping up that guys keep modifying, rewriting old things. Here's a, a screenshot of Sentry MBA, and what the reason I put this in here is to let you understand a little bit about how easy it is to use this stuff. I mean, you see this is just an easy GUI here, and an attacker, you don't need to know how to write a line of code. You just plug in the credentials you get you plug in the proxy IP addresses you get and you click that nice big button there with a lightning bolt that says go and you just go and launch the attack. So when I, you know, one of the requirements in there was config files configured for a certain target. So what are these files? Well, they're an instruction set for the tool determining if it's, you know, determining what's a failed and successful login 
And some of these, some of these uh, config files are a little more sophisticated and they have an optional capture setting on them whereby uh, attackers can gather all the information about a given account without having to log back in again. Uh, so that sort of increases, uh, lowers their own exposure to risk to determine the value of the accounts and they can sell them for what they're actually worth. Um, some quick facts about the underground ecosystem. What Mayank and I did is we went to the most popular cracking forum for one of these tools and just scraped all the data and said, what, who are they attacking? What's out there? We found you know, over 1,800 unique target sites, unique config files. 10% um, of the Alexa top thousands have config files readily available. And again, roughly 10% of those, 184 here, are config files for APIs at those enterprises. So the criminals have you know, decided to move from maybe they met some resistance on the web channel and they moved right over and you see those attacks uh, growing in scale. Now, the average cost of a config file is actually remarkably cheap. Uh, it's only $1.73. It does vary by industry and by target. Um, we have that, that link at the bottom there is a, a threat report we did on this. You can check out if you're interested in a certain industry. Um, but, you know, this is actually one of the chief ways that some of the smart, smarter attackers monetize is they write these configs and they sell them. Now, $1.73 isn't much, but when you're multiplying that by a few thousand downloads, it's a nice little passive income stream for those guys. And the top industries targeted on this forum happen to be gaming, entertainment, e-commerce. Uh, there are plenty of other targets and plenty of other forums too. But that's just a quick highlight from one of the forums. Um, now, moving on to sets of stolen credentials. This is what the attackers need to plug into those tools. We've got, here's a, just a picture of the haveibeenpwned.com homepage. Just, you know, showing you the scale of all the leaked data that's out there. And the thing here is attackers, you know, obviously they can go try and procure this data from whoever their sources may be. Um, there's, you know, massive amounts of data on there. You see MySpace, LinkedIn, Adobe, all these breaches that happened, you know, maybe even years ago in some cases. But attackers could also do something as simple as, you know, wh what we've done is write a simple crawler for pastebin.com and we'll harvest more than 20,000 credentials every day just run it on an AWS instance, and I'm sure some bad guys are doing the exact same thing. They just scrape everything and use it as soon as it pops up. And what, you know, this problem relies on the, the law of large numbers. This is a, a stat from a Microsoft research team that users average six and a half credentials per 50 websites. So password reuse is a problem. Like, we're probably, a lot of us are guilty of it, even though we don't realize it, um, or some sort of pattern of reuse. And... Uh, criminals are looking to exploit that stuff. So here's a quick aside. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail of these numbers here. This is from Dell SecureWorks, but I want to run you through a little bit of a hypothetical situation down at the bottom where let's say an attacker tries a million credentials in one attack campaign. And let's say each stolen account is selling for 25 cents. This is a common one, like common worth of an account or a batch of accounts on more on a gaming or an entertainment site like to stream something or on Netflix and the like. Say they log in with only a 0.1% success rate. Well, that'll net them 250 bucks in just one campaign. And keep that $250 mark in mind as sort of like, pretend that's a break-even point for the attackers because we'll come back to that later. Um, so now I'll move into sort of the, these next two uh, areas of an attacker's perspective, the ability to rotate through many IP addresses and compute power. I'm going to show you three examples of what we've seen of how the attackers procure their infrastructure to go about launching these attacks. Now first, from an attacker's perspective, is cloud hosting providers. And I might think if I'm launching this stuff, I'll say, well, if I can use Amazon or Google Cloud or another cloud hosting provider, I know that a, a defender is never going to blacklist or alert on an organization like that because they have a high reputation and they don't want to drown themselves in false positives. And B, they know that these IP addresses get recycled very frequently. So they can't hope to blacklist IPs because soon, you know, the IP will get recycled and is used by a legitimate, either, you know, legitimate user or a legitimate business partner who runs their infrastructure on AWS. So this chart here, I apologize, it's a little small, but it's basically showing you the volume. This is a data in the month of September from a United States retailer, and it's just the volume of traffic from certain cloud hosting providers. The big spikes there 
are Quadranet, um, Chupa LLC, and OVH hosting, and Linode as well. And compare that chart to you know the IP distribution. We see some of the or some of those providers tend to have attack traffic rotating through many more IPs than others. Uh, you see here Linode is the big spike in the middle, uh, whereas you know Quadranet, DigitalOcean, and we see Amazon make a little bit of an appearance there. And the, the chart on the right is the percentage of malicious traffic that we saw from these organizations, from these providers. And we actually saw at, at a whole, when you group all the traffic together, less than 2.5% of traffic from these cloud providers was legitimate at this retailer. And you know the, the, high, the high reputation providers perform better. 15% was legitimate because you do have aggregators and business partners running on that infrastructure. But 15% is still remarkably low when you're looking at this from a defensive perspective. And the question here is how long do these IPs stick around and continue to send malicious traffic before being recycled? You know, an attacker thinks, okay, I, like I'm sort of in the clear because these orgs aren't going to get blacklisted, these IPs won't get blacklisted. But what we found is actually not entirely true. We found that 80% of these uh, IP addresses showed up in our own internal threat database, which is actually comprised mostly of open source data, which, you know, which anyone can have access to. And we found that over 50% of the IPs showed up at other customers of ours. So obviously that's not public data, but it just shows you that the same IPs are being reused in different campaigns. I'm um, sorry. Uh, and one more thing before I move into this, the, this picture is uh, the, these IPs showed up on average, uh, you know, 92% of them showed up more than a week before the attack. So the, the, the data wasn't stale. It was hanging around for a while, and you know the average date that they first showed up was more than four months before the attack. Now this picture is traffic that we've seen from Amazon. You see, you know, certain attack tool behaviors. In this case, I'm just highlighting some user agent strings, but you know, you'll see uh, different attack tool fingerprints. You'll see leaked credentials come up. This is all from Amazon. Over 364 user agent strings that are associated with these attackers. Um, option two, here's an, so the first option for an attacker to gather infrastructure is that cloud providers. Second option here, we're going to talk a little bit about compromised devices and, and IoT botnets. This is data that we observed in December 2016 through, sorry, that should say January 2017 at a, a financial institution. And what we did is we saw, you know, we saw these IPs routing a bunch of attack traffic. We had a little bit of an idea of what tool they were using. We weren't entirely sure. And what we decided to do is just go to those IP addresses on the internet and go to the common ports and see what the hell turned up. And we saw a bunch of open home routers, in particular from uh, Telmex, which is the residential provider in Mexico. We saw like 10 DVR camera systems. We saw some web servers. We even saw this uh, like a SCADA system and some webcams. So devices of all sorts that were sitting out there open and traffic was being routed through them. Now here's an example, a screenshot of one of the IPs we went to. Um, the admin page, the whole thing, just sitting wide open on port 8080. And uh, an interesting thing here that I wanted to note was we went to the SSH logs of the, of the page and we could observe sort of a tug of war between attackers. We saw you know, a bunch of other third parties trying to brute force login into these into these routers so that they could commandeer it, take control of it, and use that IP space for either their own attacks or to resell to others. Here are other device examples, uh, quick screenshots. I, I won't really go through these in too much detail, but we saw, you know, the Intel Bras camera system. That's, a, I think, um, a provider in Brazil. And we saw a bunch of routers that, um, you know, were the you know default login password accessible right there of different versions and different types. Uh, now the third option is this is sort of the most interesting and maybe the most unique. Um, and we we struggled what to call it and we called it an artificially geo distributed proxy farm. And our little term is the the AWS for bad guys. And you might be thinking what the hell is this old guy doing on the screen here, Levi Strauss? Well. Shameless plug for our home of California, but in the, the gold, for those of you who know about the gold rush in the, late, in the mid 1800s in California, there were, you know, all the miners came west to try and strike it rich and they're searching for riches and they toil and trouble and work hard, you know, to sit in the dirt basically and pan for little flakes of gold. 
Well, these guys often didn't strike it rich. The people who really struck it rich were the infrastructure providers, the guys who sold them food, who sold them shelter, who sold them the tools they needed, and the jeans that they wore. Levi's created, this is where he created his jean company. He didn't actually start making the jeans, I think, until like 1860s or 70s, but still he created his little empire there. And so we're highlighting this because we basically have an infrastructure provider that we've found launching a lot of these attacks. Here are some of the orgs, ISPs, and ASNs that we, we observed. And I want to highlight for you the, um, you know, a lot of this data here in green, the screenshot is sort of what we mapped out. What, uh, it's a, a pattern that we observe from all their networks. They take a big slash 22 or slash 21 slash 20 CIDR range and break it down into a ton of slash 25 networks. And you see they've got a, uh, a Seoul network, you know, Las Vegas, Tehran, all over the globe. You know, you need a proxy from anywhere. You got it from this guy. And the IP space is all, you know, registered under the same higher level CIDR range. So this was suspicious. Um, this, this who is record is sort of a representative one from one of the, the Panama networks that they had. Um, so here's some more indicators. Once we saw this was suspicious, we dug into it a little bit. We saw this email address here on a lot of the Whois records, and we went to some forums and we saw someone using the same pseudonym of, as that email address, marketing you know proxies. Come buy my proxies at this site buy.findproxy.org. Um, here's the hosting. This is the uh, the hosting history. Basically, just rotates between Cloudflare and DigitalOcean for that domain, buy.findproxy.org. And we, we observed from these, you know, these proxies and these networks uh, over 40,000 IP addresses from 61 different countries, 2% of login traffic at, uh, at, a, at a U.S. retailer for over four months. So this wasn't just one attacker executing these attacks. It was like, you know, he'd resell to a person using attack tool A, attack tool B, attack tool C, and they just keep coming and keep coming and don't really go away. Because he's, he's the one raking in the money selling this infrastructure to these people. Nearly 75% of traffic, this, this chart here is which country, according to third-party geolocation providers like MaxMind that it came from, and the big bar over there is the United States. They're blending in with United States customers at a United States retailer. Makes perfect sense. That's what you'd want to do if you're an attacker. Thousands of accounts compromised every week. And the question is, you know, was this traffic really coming from the United States? And the answer in most cases was no. It was about 70% of it coming from this one uh, data center in Russia. And then the other 30%, there was an ASN in the United States that was, uh, that was hosting a lot of the traffic. So this, the, these graphs right here are a, a trace route experiment that we did. We'd take these networks of IPs and ping them from different locations around the globe. And just highlighting here, th these are a bunch of cities in the United States that these networks claim to be from. And you see when the mean round trip time from Moscow here, you just go down the list. Ignore the mean column here and focus on the median because there were some that would hang. But three milliseconds from Moscow, 100 and 130, 135 roughly from Washington. So that doesn't make sense. I mean, Honolulu is pretty far away from Baltimore. Same, you know, same deal here when we talk about the different countries that these, other, that these subnets would be registered to. You see the same pattern. Uh, so this, like, once again, raised our suspicion. Um, here's a, this picture is from the uh, Wondernet. Like, this is, these are the actual mean round trip times when you just ping things, uh, like any normal IP address. And that 150, or 135, 140 value, I think the, yeah, Chicago, Moscow to Chicago, that's what, you know, when we looked at it and we compared those values and we said, yeah, we're pretty close here. So we can say with pretty high confidence that this stuff is not coming from all these different countries it says it's coming from. Um, this chart down here is traffic that actually came from the United States. What countries did MaxMind say it was coming from? Only about, you know, a little bit over a third United States and a bunch of traffic from other places. The, the chart for the traffic coming from Russia is even more colorful and more countries. Um, how do they monetize this stuff? Well, here's the, or this attacker, this, you know, my, our friend that we compared to Levi Strauss there. Well, he, here's the website. And the reason I, you know, had you keep that $250 mark in mind is that's what he's selling access to this, this service at for a month, 250 bucks. 
And um, he, they even say here in the website, we have our data center in Kaluga, Russia. Um, and interestingly enough, a lot of the other orgs and ISPs would, there was all these vague references to like region 40 or like depot data center. Um, and we looked up, so when I looked up the city of Kaluga, I found that uh, region 40 of Russia is actually, when you look at the municipal vehicle, like auto buses, license plate codes, region 40 is Kaluga. So all the buses there start with region 40. So all these clues kind of keep like, you know, that I was tying together. And this, this is that same depot 40 uh, website where of the data center that was, that was hosting these guys. So that's a little bit about all the attackers, sort of different methodologies. Now from a defender's perspective, how do we detect these attacks in a proactive way? Here are our five pillars of detection for protecting against these attacks. I'm going to I'll just scroll through these here, and I'll, we're going to go through them one by one. But the first one we're going to start with is, you know, analyzing the HTTP request fingerprints of these attack tools, studying the default configuration files. And we'll start with that tool, the first tool I highlighted, Sentry MBA. Um, we call it, you know, a plug and play attack tool, like I said, because it's so easy to use. Well, here's a list of, you know, the, just the default user agent strings. And you might think, all right, that's only going to get me so far because attackers will just change. Well, turns out most of the time they don't. They, um, we, we analyzed down here, we, we analyzed the HTTP fingerprint of these tools. We analyzed over 1,500 config files and found that only 12% changed the request fingerprint. So extremely valuable low-hanging fruit for detection if you're looking to stop these attack tools. Oftentimes they're missing the, the refer header, accept language header, accept encoding header. And that sixth user agent string you see down here, the testing UA, is not even supposed to be used by, you know, th that's when the attacker is testing if the tool works and if their config works. And oftentimes we'll see attack campaigns where the entire thing is the testing UA because they can't even use the tool right. So interesting behavior there. Here's some traffic patterns from Century MBA, just showing you that there's a variety of like high velocity spikes here. The red traffic is Century, the green is all traffic for a certain day. And these longer periods of low and slow attacks. Sentry's, you know, configurable. You can configure the number of bots you want to use and run the attack either low and slow or fast and furious. Uh, we, we see recon activity with, you know, successful login rates less than 0.01% and verified credential attacks with successful login ratios. You know, they take a list that they've already verified, they log in with 99% success rate. This is another just a representative cluster of Sentry MBA traffic. The second pillar of detection that we want to talk about is a concept that we've looked a lot at and we call it, we call it forged browser behavior. Why would a normal user, you know, advertise themselves on the user agent string as Chrome but really be running something totally different? And it's a suspicious behavior. We're not entirely, we don't really care about what it is they say they are. We just care that they're not what they're claiming. They're, what, we don't care what they're really behaving like. We just care that they, they're not acting like who they say they are. And we've developed some machine learning models to sort of parse out these differences. And I want to highlight two attack tools in particular. We've got, for those of you who are familiar with American Rocky movies, that'll explain our goofy names here, Vlad and Drago. But um, these, two these two tools are, you know, the first one, Vlad, impersonates Firefox 40 on Windows 10 via the user agent string. And it actually behaves more similar to a command line tool like wget or curl. And similar from the, uh, the attack tool Drago impersonating Chrome 56 on Windows 8.1. And we looked at all the other traffic from all the other Chrome families, and it just behaved nothing like it. So once again, a suspicious suspicious pattern from a defensive perspective. We saw, you know, when, when we compiled all these attack tools together, we see you know, in this graph here that every single large spike at these, you know, at this retailer's infrastructure was caused by one of these attack tools. So the infrastructure was massively over provisioned and there are tons of cost savings for them just to fingerprint these attack tools. And you know, they're coming from thousands of different IPs, thousands of different orgs, hundreds of countries, all in just in one day. Uh, and no single ISP or org is responsible for more than 3.5% of these tools' traffic. So, you, you know, it's, it, from a detection perspective, you're going to need to go beyond playing whack-a-mole a little bit. 
Um, the third uh, pillar of detection we talk about is a, a threat intelligence component designed to go after those resources that, you know, the stolen credentials that attackers are going to use or the infrastructure uh, that we already talked about. And I want to just highlight uh, some traffic patterns as far as stolen credentials are concerned. Uh, you know, top breaches observed per attack tool. In that Century MBA attack tool, we observed that 23% of the credentials used were coming from the MySpace breach. 19% from Adobe and 17% from LinkedIn. And an important thing to note is down here, each you know, username tried by that tool appeared in an average of three and a half breaches. You know, our attack tool Vlad, that one that was impersonating Firefox 40, uh, had you know, similar patterns, just a little bit higher ratios of everything, of all these breaches. And same thing, each username tried appeared in 3.4 breaches on average. When we looked at legitimate traffic, things that weren't, you know, forged browser behavior, things that we didn't think were an attack tool, we actually saw that 42% of usernames didn't appear in any breaches at all, which surprised me. I thought that that was actually a pretty high number because you kind of got to think that everything's already out there. And each username appeared in an average of 2.6 uh, breaches. So finally, we'll move on to kind of the, the last two here. Um, covering your web, mobile, and API channels, you know, because attackers are going to move wherever there's least resistance. And the first tool we'll highlight on an API was one of them, you know, back at a, 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 at a similar retailer, a legacy API that 97.2% of their traffic to this legacy API login was coming from this, you know, cool pad attack tool that is a popular Chinese mobile device, but you know, this U.S. retailer doesn't do any business in China, so they're looking at that kind of like, what's going on here? And it was all of their traffic to their legacy API. No one was really supposed to use this thing because they basically didn't know what was going on on the, lo on the legacy API login until they were able to use some of these detection methodologies and fingerprint technologies. Um, final attack tool I want to highlight is one that um, ex explains a little bit about long-term, longer period of time behaviors, that fifth pillar. Uh, this was uh, a, a tool that was responsible for almost 40% of web login. And the behavior pattern I want to focus on here is this, this third one. Um, an average of, over an extended period of time, exactly one login request per unique username over a sustained period of time. That would mean that, you know, if all of us went to our bank account right now and tried to log in, that every single person in this room would remember their password and username on the very first attempt and log in which is highly unlikely, or those of you who fail in the room will just leave. Like, you came to the account with a purpose of logging in, so you're not going to just leave. Legitimate traffic tends to see a pattern of more like 1.15 to 1.3 login requests per unique username, that which would mean, you know, about 20% of us in the room would either forget our password and try again, or forget our password a few times and just hit reset password. This tool also, you know, showed... Uh, traffic from 210 different countries with the same accept language value always, you know, and, you know, even though, I mean, that's, a, that's typically a default, uh, default value. Um, us Americans are not generally good with other languages, so you would think that we would see some change here in these values. Conclusions and takeaways. Uh, easy to use attack tools have made these barriers to entry lower than ever before. These things, you don't even need to know how to write a line of code to execute these attacks. The, the sensitive data breaches, the, the infrastructure that the criminals gather, these are, gonna these are gonna continue. And you know, defenders, one thing you can do is to try and pursue this data for preventative measures. Gather, you, know, you saw that slide earlier about which credentials appear most frequently with which attack tools. If you can find a way to gather that data, you can use that for good purposes of fl flagging those accounts. Um, and you know, researching and fingerprinting these network characteristics of the tool will provide an effective first step. So things like you find the default config of a tool and you can just run it through Wireshark, run it through whatever infrastructure you have and look at you know, the default and assume that there are gonna be plenty of attackers that won't change the default. So start there with the low hanging fruit. And then final takeaway is that attackers are gonna migrate. Um, They'll, you know, defenders need visibility into their API traffic. So um, beware that, the, that these attacks will occur there plenty, plenty as well. So with that, 
That's all she wrote. Thank you very much. Um, my ink and my contact information is there. And I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your rest of the conference. Thanks, Will.